Welcome to the Michigan Man Podcast on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew for Wolverine fans from coast to coast. Go Blue and welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. The first full week of practice in pads is underway and it's been another week of the NCAA lobbing grenades at Jim Harbaugh and leaking NOA drafts. Joining us in just a few minutes to discuss that and much more will be beat writer Aaron McMahon from M Live. Earlier this week, Will Johnson, Ernest Hausman, and Colston Loveland spent some time with Michigan Media. Will and Colston talked about what it feels like to start the season as defending national champions. Now everyone's chasing you, so you are the champion. You are the one that has that has that trophy. So it's a little more motivation. Um, it's a little different because you're not just just chasing. You're still chasing it, but you're trying to keep it too. Yeah, we got to do what we did. Um, you know, we got to come in and work. We got to keep our feet where we're where we're at, right under us, and uh, you know, just day by day. Um, can't get ahead of ourselves. Can't look for another championship. You know what I'm saying? We got to fall in love with the process. Ernest Hausman says part of the process this summer is keeping in mind they are not the hunter this year, but the hunted. Whatever we did last year, we had to tighten up our details even more. You know, we got to practice even harder. You know, all these different things that we can find a way to improve on um, and, and make even better is what we're going to have to do to make sure we win a national, another national championship. All three players were asked to describe fall camp in just three words. A grind, a lifestyle, and passion. Long, um, developmental, detailed. Competitive, fun. Grind. Colston Loveland shared his thoughts on what makes these practices fun. It's the fun. It's just, uh, you know, with, with our teammates, all the coaches, you know, it's just straight ball for a month. You know, we don't got to worry about school. We don't got to worry about anything in our personal lives. Kind of let it all go and just worry about ball and getting, becoming the best football player we can be. And yeah, so that, that's super fun. Will Johnson says the key to having a good camp and getting ready for the season begins with being uncomfortable. And you just can't get comfortable um, with anything. You can't get comfortable in meetings, you can't get comfortable at practice, you can't get comfortable thinking down into the future about or in the past, just keeping it day by day, staying in the moment. I mean, that's how you become the best person of yourself, I believe. Our guest today says the NCAA stuff is not going away anytime soon, and it could be a distraction once again this year. But we should be excited about Team 145 and the fast approaching season. Up next on our game day segment, is beat writer Aaron McMahon from M Live. So stay with us. Joining us on the show this week as we preview the upcoming season and, of course, talk about some other things is a beat writer Aaron McMahon from M Live. Great to have you back with us, Aaron. Happy August, Mike. Camp's here. Uh, football's around the corner. We, like you said, we've got other stuff to discuss, but. Uh, I'm glad to be back in football mode. Oh, yeah. I mean, we uh, look forward to this uh, for so long. Of course, it seems like we just uh, hung the national championship banners, and here we are again. But this pesky little NCAA investigation, or the two of them, have uh, popped up again in the last week. Of course, we're, we're taping on Thursday morning. So yesterday, Wednesday, the NCAA rolled out its penalties uh, for uh, Jim Harbaugh. And a lot of, uh, I think a lot of fans thought, wow. We knew something would happen, but they stuck it to him, and I don't know if it even matters, Aaron. No, that's right. That's the question here, right, or the, the, I guess the overarching thing. You know, he got a four-year show cause penalty, which includes a year of suspension, which basically makes him difficult to hire within the college realm for the next four years to the end of 2027. But, you know, you got to remember, he signed a five-year contract to become the head coach of the Los Angeles Chargers. So assuming he doesn't get fired there in the next couple of years, it's really not going to matter, I don't think, a whole lot. Uh, nonetheless, I mean, it's, it's obviously taken over the headlines uh, naturally. It's what everyone, wanna t- everyone wants to talk about in the college football world. Um, you know, I, I think we all knew this was some type of punishment was coming. It was just a matter of what. Um, you know, the NCAA was clearly, you know, I, I thumbed through the entire 48-page uh, ruling that the NCAA uh, sent out yesterday, and it was clear in the language they used that they were bothered by Jim's failure to cooperate or they're, they're dealing they're de- what they deemed as failure to cooperate. Um, and that's really what stung him here. You know, had he had he just got, been up front about it from the get go, I, I think the, the the punishment would have been probably lesser uh, lessened. Uh, he, in fact, Michigan probably wouldn't have been in a position to enforce, you know, suspend him to, be, to the beginning of the season last year. But nonetheless, that's where we're at right now. 
Um, you know, he faces, if he were to come back to the college game before the end of 2027, he, he would A, be suspended for the first year no, for no matter what, and then the school that would hire him if they would, if they did, um, they have to you know, show proof to the NCAA that um, they're going to abide by this this penalty and monitor him and, and the like. Well, you're a good man. If you could wade through that uh, 48 pages, I, uh, I I got started on it and said, uh, you know, forget it. I, I get the gist of it. But that uh, that's going to linger as a story for a long time. And I'm sure Jim and his family don't like what it does to their reputation. Not much they can do right now. You know, then on Sunday, uh, ESPN reported on a draft of notices allegation for Michigan or against Michigan, which contains really a number of uh, possible level one violations for non-compliance and recruiting. And this is what we refer to, I guess, more commonly as sign gate. Interesting timing, but uh, it's out there, isn't it? At least one of the drafts is out there. Yeah, yeah. Like, this was another situation where we knew it was coming. We just didn't know when. Um, and, and again, yeah, someone at the NCAA apparently leaked it to ESPN on Sunday. Um, I'm not even haven't gotten a clarity yet if Michigan's actually gotten a copy of right. it yet. Um, but none, but nonetheless, it is a draft, which means it's kind of a working living document that NCAA is working on. Eventually, at some point, they'll they'll, they'll finalize a, a a formal notice of allegations and issue it to Michigan. Uh, Michigan will be given the 90 days to respond, and then they'll go from there and whether to se- decide whether to settle or move on or whatever the case may be. But um, yeah, it's it's more damning maybe for the university. Uh, than anyone individually. Obviously, Connor Stallions is facing a potential level one violation. Jim Harbaugh, I believe, is facing a potential level one violation. Sheryl Moore is facing a level two. He's probably the most relevant of the, of, of the folks involved just because he's still at Michigan and he's certainly the head coach. Um, you know, to me, the, the big story coming out of that is he was actually physically texting with Connor Stallions. You know, there's a chain of, I think, 52 text messages that he apparently deleted uh, the day that the, the allegations came out or were, were made public. So that's something I think the NCAA is going to wade through. We don't know what the text message has said. We don't know if, you know, if Sharon actually knew what was going on. That still remains to be seen. You know, given Sharon's past, and this goes for the school itself, Michigan as well, you know, Sharon was just hit with a level two violation with the recruiting violations uh, that just wrapped up. So he's going to be deemed, a, you know, a quote-unquote repeat offender, um, as will the university in of itself. So that could um, maximize the penalty here. Um, you know, when the NCAA sends out a, dra- uh, a notice of allegations, because um, I, I read through the one with the recruiting violations, at the end of it, they kind of list uh, a series of mitigating factors and aggravating, aggravating factors. So they can kind of pool together any previous inc- run-ins with the NCAA and use that against you. So the fear here, I think, internally, um, and probably with the fan base, is Jerome Moore could be slapped with a serious penalty if he's found in violation um, with, with the sign-stealing stuff. So... Um, it remains to be seen. Um, obviously, Connor Stallions is no longer employed at Michigan. Jim Harbaugh is gone. Some of the staffers who were, who were uh, interns and the like, or maybe were knew what was going on or were communicating with Connor behind the scenes, they're no longer employed either. So I, I think that the, the things that are still kind of standing out there is what, what will the NCAA do to Michigan with regards to the science link stuff, and then what will happen to Sharon Moore? Well, it's interesting with the uh, Sharon Moore uh, text message thing because there were 50-some-odd text messages. The NCAA has had those messages uh, for some time now, so you'd think if there was anything damning in there or anything linking him to uh, sign stealing, they would have already talked about that. Mm-hmm. I think the more interesting thing is there and what non-compliance means in the uh, NCAA world. From what I understand, when they asked for those text messages, Sharon went to a third party because, hey, I bet he didn't trust the NCAA to mm-hmm. mirror or image his phone. And uh, that seems to be what the non-compliance is going to a third party as opposed to going to them directly from, again, from what I understand. So when we read those terms, non-compliance, they have their own really crazy uh, kind of interpretation, don't they? Yeah. I mean, you got to remember, they, the NCAA is not a court of law. We're not operating under like a, you know, a, a, a law here. Uh, these are the NCAA's rules. These are their, their interpretation of the rules. Uh, and they're they're basically judge, jury, and executioner in these situations, right? Uh, you saw what they did to Jim Harbaugh with the recruiting stuff for his uh, non-compliance, and I think that's probably the fear with Sharon Moore is that if they deemed him non-compliant in the situation, and you throw in the, the recruiting violations with it, with him involved, like, that you know it could deem a uh, you know a, a, some type of penalty. So I, I don't expect a closure with this case anytime soon. As I mentioned, the Michigan's going to get you know three months to respond. There's probably going to be a lot of back and forth. I expect Michigan's probably try and drag this out. Maybe 
as long as they can, just kind of like how they deal with the recruiting stuff. Um, wouldn't surprise me at some point if they maybe preemptively, you know, issue a suspension of Sharon like they did Jim last year, but we'll see. You know, it's interesting when you read Sharon's contract he signed in January when he became the head coach. Um, there is specific language in there for Michigan to, um, you know, uh, fire him for cause if they find him, in, you know, in, in, you know, it, um, you know, in trouble with the NCAA again. So it surely opens the door for that to happen. There's obviously been no indication that is the plan moving forward, but you do wonder how much, you know, War, athletic director Warren Manuel knew um, about Sharon's involvement, the sign stealing stuff and his communications with counter stallions um, when he decided to promote him. So that's going to be a storyline certainly we'll be watching here in the, in the coming months. Well, you know, the ironic aspect of the, uh, the story of the leak to me anyway, is that, you know, the NOA is focused on, and we saw this term used, several times and places in the NOA concerned with undermining the integrity of college football. But the draft was obviously leaked by someone at the NCAA, which in itself shows quite a lack of integrity, doesn't it? Yeah, this whole case has kind of been extraordinary from the get-go in terms of the, the nature of the allegations, the situation at the hand, the, the way the NCAA has handled this whole thing been kind of out of character for them uh a lot of things have been leaked to different media sources um you know you saw with the recruiting or recruiting violations uh Derek Crawford vice president of enforcement the NCAA came out publicly and commented on it when they normally don't do that and they even acknowledge as much that they don't usually come out and speak so it's been a weird situation from the get-go you know I think it's one of the reasons why Michigan's tried to shut up and not say anything publicly because they don't want to make anything worse than it looks but yeah, I mean, from just from a public standpoint, you know, someone who maybe isn't isn't you know, uh, inti- you know, intimately uh, involved with Michigan or the program itself. I think if you stand out from what you know outside of it and look at this whole thing, it it kind of looks silly for every, every every all of it. So I don't know. It's gonna be an interesting thing to follow. I don't know how the NCAA is gonna uh, operate here moving forward. I, they clearly were, I, you know, I felt like a little out of bounds with the recruiting stuff. Uh, and we'll see where, where they go here, the sign stealing stuff. Yeah, as you said, this is not going away anytime soon. So in the meantime, let's uh, let's move our attention over to uh, something much more interesting, which is uh, the upcoming season. Practice started last week. This is the first full week, and, of course, the team is in pads. Coach Campbell said last week quarterbacks were taking snaps by seniority. At least that's how he was going to start things uh, in camp. And I don't know, a lot of folks – are hoping in the next week or two there is a starter or kind of a plan revealed for uh, the first few games. But I don't think it's important as long as they know who they want under center. Do you? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I do think whoever they end up going with, you know, it's going to, in, in a way, I think, dictate how the offense operates. You've really got three individuals who have different skill sets, uh, maybe different strengths. And I, and I do think, you know, Kirk Campbell's prepared to kind of tailor the offense to that. Now, there are things they can do with all three, and Kirk's acknowledged that. Uh, you know, they feel like they've got a, a solid run game. They're going to certainly use the tight ends. I certainly think whoever he ends up going with, and it's going to be a curious, interesting decision to make uh, because I don't really think there's a clear-cut favorite here. Uh, you know, you look at Alex Orgy, and I think he's, you know, he's an interesting guy. He's, I think, the more dynamic of the three just in terms of his, his running ability and what he can do outside the pocket. You know, as we've seen, or maybe you haven't seen, he hasn't thrown the ball a ton. And when he has, it hasn't been – particularly impressive. So my understanding is he did spend the off season working with a quarterback's coach down South. Uh, he put a lot of time into his passing game early on. We've heard some pretty good things out of him from camp, but it is early. Uh, as you said, they just got in the pad. So uh, he's probably the front runner at this point. Jack Tuttle, I, I think is probably the safe option here just in terms of his experience. I mean, he's seven through guys. He has started before at the power five level. He started, you know, five games at Indiana. He was technically the backup last year until he got injured, and that's kind of where things went south here, right? He, he didn't finish mm-hmm. the year uh, on the roster. He didn't practice in the spring, so Michigan didn't really get a good look at him. Um, by all accounts, he's healthy and ready to go. And then Davis Warren is a name we've talked about for years, I feel like. Um, and, you know, we were, we were talking to a player uh, yesterday, Quentin Johnson, defensive back, and he said that uh, from a passing perspective, uh, he felt like Davis Warren's put together the best practice of camp when it comes to throwing the football. So if you're looking for someone to throw the football, and I think it you know goes back to the spring game. I thought Davis looked the best throwing the football there as well. But again, unproven, hasn't played a ton at the college level, uh, and you, you don't know how he's going to fare in this big-time moment. Well, on Sunday morning, uh, Colston, Loveland, Miles Hinton, Will Johnson, Ernest Hosman uh, met with the media. Then yesterday you had a chance to see, uh, as you mentioned, Quinton Johnson, Kalel Mullings, Josiah Stewart, and Tyler Morris. Anything interesting that you could glean or 
read in between the lines from those guys as far as uh, what they think of the team so far? Not a ton. It, it, it's more difficult early in camp because I, it's still very much a filling out process. Yeah. Um, you know, the defense is certainly still ahead of the offense, uh, as we expected coming out of spring. I think that the, uh, the, the offense is finally starting to find itself. Uh, and I'll be honest, I took probably more out of the players we spoke to uh, yesterday, Wednesday, than, than I did those guys. Uh, just based on, uh, you know, it, it sounds like in talking to Tyler Morris, the receiver, and talking to some of the defensive players, it sounds like the plan is to open the offense up a little more. At least that's what Kirk Campbell wants to do. I, I don't know if that signals anything to, you know, he's, he's, where he's leading with the quarterback position. But a part of me wonders if they're going to they're going to try and throw the ball around the field a little bit more this year. Um, we don't have Blake Corum, so we don't have that that bona fide, you know, maybe first first and second down back. Um, and again, unproven at the quarterback position. You've got an offensive line who I think is probably better in pass protection than they are run in run blocking at this point. That's kind of where I think things stand. Uh, defensively, we've gotten a lot of coy from. Mike Martindale and the players about how they plan to kind of interject some of the blitzing and some of the things he likes to do. So um, a lot of, a lot of, you know, a lot of unknowns at this point. I, I think Michigan's trying to stay quiet for a reason. They, they know the defense is good, but they got some things to figure out offensively as well. Yeah, this is a tough month. Uh, I always like to say August is a speculation month. We we think we know how good this team is, but you know, you're not sure until you tee it up and. I like to get each of my guest thoughts this month, uh, especially the beat writers on how uh, they see this team or what they expect. So, Aaron, starting uh, with the offense, when you look at it and think about it before the season starts, uh, what should the realistic expectations for them be this year as you see it? That's a good question. I, I think I, I think they have the makings to be an explosive unit. You know, if you look at some of the players they have, Donovan Edwards has big, is a big play threat. Colston Loveland's a very good uh, tight end catching the football. Um, Samaj Morgan is, has the potential to break a big play at any moment. Tyler Morris really came on as the season came went on last year and played very well in the Rose Bowl. You've got a lot of guys who I think beginning to find their stride. Um, especially you know that at the end of last year, the problem is the season ended <laughs> and they stopped playing football. So you wonder how quickly they can pick that up this year. Um, the offensive line, well, I don't think is as good uh, maybe as previous years. I, I I don't think is 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 you know average either. I I do think they're still going to be pretty good. Sheryl Moore still helping to coach them. They've got an experienced group, a bunch of guys who have you know like a couple of years ago had kind of been around the program a while but hadn't played a ton. Um, they've just kind of been waiting their turn and, and biding their time. So I, I think the offensive line can hold up. Um, I, I think they've got some explosive playmakers on the outside. It's going to come down to whether they can run the football, I think, in between the tackles and whether they can you know, find a quarterback who doesn't turn the ball over and can beat that steady, consistent leader. Well, even with the unknowns and the question marks on the, uh, the offensive side of the ball, plenty of talent there. It's just, uh, you know, you have to develop it and see what happens uh, as the season progresses. But I think the good thing is, and the sensible thing, what Coach Campbell and the offense know is that with that defense, whatever they're going to do offensively, sling the ball around a little more than we think or be run-centric, that defense gives them the luxury to find their way and experiment, doesn't it? Yeah, I think the defense is going to keep them in games uh, this year. You know, they've got a lot of talent back at all three levels. Um, it's very much the similar similar you know scheme as, as you know, what Michigan's been running the last couple of years. You know, I do expect it to be modified some with Wink at the helm. Uh, he does does like to blitz a lot more. Uh, that's kind of his MO, and that's what he likes to do. But at the same token, I think he realizes that maybe they, they, they're going to have to dial it back some, and he's going to be a little more judicious in his decision-making this year. Uh, but I, I think the talent level, top to bottom, is, is very good. Uh, you've got experience and, and depth, really, at all three levels. Um, you've got some uh, elite guys in, in the middle. Uh, you've got you got experienced guys on the edge. You've got a deep secondary um, that I, I thought Michigan did a very good job of kind of replacing in the offseason. You had some injuries to like Rod Moore. You had some departures like Keon Sab, and I thought Michigan did a very good job of filling back filling those guys and br- and bringing in more talent and voice than I think they needed to kind of fill in the holes there. So this defense is, is going to be very good. I expect it to be another top ten unit this year. Uh, they'll probably keep them in games and and you know and and get get the offense to football. It's just a matter of whether the offense can can drive down the field, put together those clock, those time-turning drives like Michigan has, has been so accustomed to doing the last couple of years. If we're going to uh, have those kind of uh, clock-churning uh, drives and hang on to the ball for long periods of time, so it's going to start with uh, Donovan Edwards, I think. I'm you know excited to see him finally uh, be 
sort of the man, aren't you? Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I mean, a couple of years ago, I, I think everyone saw what Don Miller was just capable of doing. You know, when he ran for almost a thousand yards and had that big game against Ohio State, um, that's Don Miller's Michigan recruited. That's yeah. the guy I think they expected. Uh, you know, he had some struggles last year. He, was, he started the year, I think, still dealing with an inju- his leg injury. Uh, then I think confidence issues took a hit when he wasn't able to kind of have those big moments and those big games that he, he himself thought. Um, he put a lot of pressure on himself last year. I remember talking in the off season. And he was saying how you know he wanted equal carry. He expected equal carries of Blake Corum. I think he wanted to try and match his production. He was talking about leaving the NFL after last year. Now that obviously happened, um, and it wasn't really until the national championship game where he kind of broke out and and reminded people who he was. I think it's, he's in a better headspace this year. He's spoken about it publicly. Uh, he's a little more mature and I think humble than he was last year. And I think that that bodes well. He needs to, I think, prove that he can be an every down back. Last year, he, he had trouble doing that, I, I think, for the reasons I, I explained. So, you know, I'm looking for him to, to have a big year, breakout year, especially uh, early on this year, have some big games, especially against some of his non-conference opponents, and, and get him going. Because he's a guy who I think gets better with more carries and confidence, and he's certainly in a position to do that. I mean, they're going to seriously, you know, they're going to probably get him 15 to 20 carries a game, and he's certainly going to be the bell cow back. The only question, and we'll see that answered, uh, if anything, when Michigan observers say, well, Donovan Edwards, he's he's a home run hitter. No question about that. He's proven that. But between the tackles, you know, the, uh, the, the second and third down runs, is he that kind of a guy? That's what we need to see this year. Right. That's the question. And I think that's where the other backs come into play, like Khalil Mullings uh, and Benjamin Hall. Those, are, uh, those two t- guys are kind of more tailored to, to run between the tackles. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons why I think maybe this Michigan offense may look a tad different than we've seen in previous years. I do think they're still going to be built on the ground game. They're going to still want to do things, uh, you know, play that smash physical style ball. But I, I do wonder if they're going to try and play a little bit more outside the tackles this year. That involves Donovan, both in the run game and the passing game, utilizing the tight ends and, and some of the slot receivers. Uh, but I, I, I do think that that's the biggest area I think it throws for Donovan this year, right, is, is, is being better between the tackles. Um, he says he's put on a few pounds this year. He's added weight and, and strength and the like to, I think, better position himself for that. But he's going to have to do it on a, on a week-to-week and a, and a down-to-down basis. And uh, we'll, see if, we'll see if he can do it. Well, another player I'm excited to see uh, more of this year and how we use him is Colston Loveland. He's sort of teased us the last uh, two years. And you say, wow, I'd like to see him get the ball in his hands more often. And it sounds like from what Coach Campbell says, they're going to get the ball in his hands more often, maybe use him more on the outside this year. So this could be, a, and it should be, a huge year for Colston, shouldn't it? It should. You know, it wouldn't surprise me at all if I'm talking to you and, you know, the October, end of October into November and he's leading the team in, in receiving her. Yeah. I, I expect him to be a, a big target for them. They're going to look to him a lot. Uh, look, he's reliable. He doesn't drop the football a lot. He's, he's a, he's a uh, mismatch uh, nightmare with opponents. He's, just, he's difficult to cover. Uh, he's a fast kid. He's, he's you know, he's, he knows where to be. He's smart. Uh, and he's, and he's experienced now. I mean, he's, he's, he's had some big moments in big games. So I think he knows what's expected of him. You know, the expectations are high. I mean, not only for internally, but externally. I mean, his name's coming up in a lot of the preseason stuff. You know, he's being considered as a preseason All-American. There's a, there's a lot going for him. Maybe yeah. potential first-round pick in the NFL draft. So I expect Kirk Campbell in the offense to utilize him a ton. You know, if, if you go back into Kirk's past as a as an OC and head coach and some of the, maybe the smaller levels of football, you know he likes using the tight ends. He's, he made that known in the spring. That's kind of part of his mo. Uh, so I expect him to use Colson level a ton. They're obviously going to use Max Burson probably more in, in run blocking situations. But the the name also we should probably be looking for as well is, is Marlon Klein, yeah. the sophomore tight end from Georgia by way of Germany. I mean, he by by all accounts he's one of the more athletic kids on the team, one of the fastest kids on the team. Uh, and it sounds like he's ready to play. So don't be surprised at all if, if you see kind of a resurgence of the two tight ends that Jim Harbaugh like to use so much, and you see a lot of close to love, and even Marlon Klein in the field this fall. Well, just about everyone I talk to says, don't worry about the offensive line. Uh, they're going to be fine. I think they will be, but you never know how a new group is going to mesh together in the trenches or how long that's going to take, do you? No, and, and I don't know if this Michigan offensive line has a depth that maybe they've had the last couple of years. Right. I think the, the initial five or six are fine. I mean, you've got a group with Miles Hinton at left tackle, very experienced. He knows what's expected of him. He played at Michigan last year. Um, Josh Pree came in from Northwestern. Again, another experienced Big Ten guy. Um, he's still got a court, uh, competition at center with Greg Crippen and Raheem Anderson. I expect Crippen to win the job, but never say never. Uh, right guard Giovanni Ohadi, again, another guy who's kind of been waiting in the wings. 
Uh, he's had some starts in the past. He's played quite a bit. Uh, now he's going to get his opportunity. Uh, and the right tackle is a battle. I mean, we, we've heard Andrew Gentry's name thrown out there, Jeff Percy's name. Uh, Evan Link, uh, a younger uh, underclassman's name has come up as well. Um, so, uh, you know, we're talking to Kurt Campbell last week. You know, he felt like they probably have uh, six or seven offensive linemen they can lean on, uh, which is good. It's a good start. Um, but as we've seen the last couple of years, Michigan's had some injury woes mm-hmm. uh, up front. Uh, they've had to fill in some guys and, and make do there. And fortunately for them, especially last year, they felt like they had nine or ten guys they can lean on. This camp and this offseason has kind of been about finding an additional couple of guys that they, they, they can kind of backfill in, in case of emergency. Well, for the last few years, really uh, maybe for the last decade or so, this time of the year, what I hear from you know my listeners and our fans is, uh, hey, we're worried about our receiving core and you know, they're always lamenting the lack of big time receivers, game changers, guys that can go over the top. But, you know, in the end, we've been pretty darn good. Their two guys went in the NFL draft uh, from last year's wideout crew. Do you like this receiving core and the prospects we're going to see this year, Aaron? It's an intriguing group. You know, it's a group of guys who I think are waiting to break out, uh, guys who I think are eager for their opportunity. Uh, you know, Samaj Morgan just showed uh, his big playability last year. I, I think there's a lot for him still to, to, to do. Uh, he's, I think, in, he's going to be a big part of this offense this year. Tyler Morris is a name who's come up quite a bit this offseason. The coaching staff have kind of urged him to, to speak up a little more and be a leader in the group. And I think he says he's ready to do it. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, he kind of came on in the season, uh, wound, wound down last year. So uh, between those two guys, I expect them to kind of carry the load. Uh, you know, you've got a group, Fred Moore's name has come up. He'll probably get some, he'll get quite a few uh, targets as well. And then Michigan made an em- a, a, you know, emphasis this offseason to kind of add some bigger body receivers. And Maureen Walker is back after transferring to Louis- or Ole Miss in the, in the spring. Uh, and then they brought in C.J. C- Sarlson from, from Youngstown State, another big bodied, experienced guy. Didn't play at the FBS level, but he, he's been around a while. And, and Michigan showed that they can, they can add guys you know, from the FBS level and they can be successful. So, um, they surely got the bodies, I think, um, in place there. They're in a better situation than they were in spring. But you're right, there's really been no, um, there's no, I guess, obvious number one here. Uh, you know, in the pre- past years, there were, you know, right, Roman Wilson and CJ, in, in, you know, uh, Cornelius Johnson last year. Uh, so it, it, it's going to be an interesting group to, to follow. It, they, they, they're, all, they're a bunch of, I think, um, you know, slot guys, uh, which is, I think, intriguing to me because it's something we haven't seen a ton at Michigan in the last couple of years. Uh, it, it, but they're waiting to find kind of that big body, reliable outside guy they can they can get the football to. Yeah, so we'll watch that group this year. It, it's going to be fun. No lack of speed. Uh, yeah, a lot of people jokingly say we've got uh, a room full of Smurfs, but you know Campbell's a, a really <laughs> bright offensive coordinator. When you have that, when you have speed, speed kills, and you find a way to use it. So I think the the, the thing I'm watching there is the Morian Walker. I mean, he is that big-bodied receiver. And we've heard for, you know, two years, of course, they moved him over to defense last year, but sure. we've heard that he's just a freaky kind of an athlete, but sure. it just hasn't come together yet. So that's one of those unknowns, and that could be huge if he does. Oh, 100%. And I think it's one of the reasons why Jim decided to move him to DB, because he saw the potential in him. At that point when they moved him, I think the, D, the receiver room was crowded, and I think you saw Jim realize which which direction they were going to go with the, with, the off, with the offense. and. And uh, it felt like he wasn't going to get a ton of touches there. So um, the, the athleticism is there. Uh, the ability is there. They just got to, you know, he's got to put together, again, another uh, guy who's got to put together on a regular basis. Just hasn't gotten a ton of targets, hasn't gotten a ton of experience uh, playing receiver at the college level. Uh, we'll see what an offseason does, did for him. Uh, you know, I, I think there's, there's, there's some quiet optimism about him. Uh, and, and we'll see if they can get him the football and he can, he can, he can make, make some plays. Well, Aaron, we haven't talked a lot about the defense. I think it's because we just don't have as many questions uh, about that unit that we expect to be uh, not only good, but elite. But if you do have any concerns right now on the defensive side of the ball, what, what pops to mind? Lack of depth at the edge, at edge rusher. Uh, remember, last year Michigan used four guys regularly. Like down, If you look at the snap counts, they're almost even. So while you had, you know, two guys are theoretically called starters, you really have four guys who split split reps. Um, that's probably not going to be the case this year. They're going to lean on Josiah Stewart and Derek Moore quite a bit. Uh, they were the backups last year, but they, they, they certainly had their moments and had big big moments in big games. Uh, you just wonder who's going to backfill them. Uh, TJ Guy is a, is, a, is a name that's come up quite a bit this spring. I think they're expecting him to take a leap this year, and we don't really know who the fourth guy is. So those edge rushers may be playing quite a bit, especially early on in the year. 
Um, and you wonder what kind of toll it's going to take on them. Yeah, you know, especially in the defense that's you know predicated, you know, again with Link at the helm of blitzing a little bit more uh, and doing different things. Uh, Michigan was so successful defensively last year because they had so much depth at all three levels. And while they largely have that this year, uh, edge rush is my, my biggest concern. One of the uh, areas of concern I have, and it, again, it's not with that defense, it's uh, the kicking game, not punting. I, I'm very confident in, in Tommy Dolman. We know what kind of a stud kicker he is. We went out and picked up uh, Dominic Zaveda, who uh, has had a solid career so far, and He's going to compete with Adam Samaha, who had a really great high school career in you know Southern Michigan. You never know with kickers, so that's going to be a, a key and interesting position to watch, isn't it? Yeah, you know I, I expect Nevada to probably get the job. I mean, typically when they bring in transfers like this, uh, it's for a reason. Uh, maybe they're not ready ready yet. You don't feel like Samaha's ready yet. Uh, remember, they brought in James Turner last year from the portal and. He ended up winning the job. Uh, he was very good, uh, very reliable. I think they probably view some uh, Zavada the same way. He was very reliable from 40, 40 and plus at Arkansas State. He was a, a finalist, I believe, for the for the kicking award at the end of the year. So I, I think they feel like they found their guy. Now we're supposed to talk to special teams coordinator J.B. Brown this week, and we'll find out more on that. But I'm expecting Zavada to win the job. I mean, I, I, I'd, I'd be surprised if Michigan with the portal brought someone in who's proven and reliable and, and didn't give him the job. Yeah. Well, we have a lot of questions uh, with Team 145, as we know, and we'll start getting some of those answers in just about three weeks. One thing we do know is this schedule is going to be brutal uh, and exciting. Even a great team might not be able to get through this unscathed. It is, it's just going to be fun to watch, isn't it? No, no doubt about it. Uh, you know, for all the fans that were upset about the week nine conference schedules in the years <laughs> past, I think this makes up for it. You get Texas yeah. week two at the, at the big house, which should be great. I mean, when was the last time we, we saw an NXT school come up here and play? So I'm excited for it. I know the, the, the team's excited for it. And you're right. You know, I don't think this is a year where Michigan's going to go 12-0. It, it would be very difficult. And if they did, it would be, it'd be super impressive. Um, the Big Ten's expanded, as we all know. There's some really good teams that came in the league with Oregon and USC's and the, and the like. Uh, they're both on Michigan's schedule, as we know. As we know, luckily they get them both at home, which I think is helpful. And they do have to go to Washington. So this is a year where I, I think Michigan could theoretically go nine and three or ten and two, and still be in the Big Ten title hunt. And certainly it, with two losses, be in the playoff hunt. I, I think this is a year where you you can afford a couple of losses and you know with the 12 team playoff. Uh, still get in. So uh, you, you, I think in a yearly basis, you're going to see leagues like the Big Ten and the SEC get routinely, you know, three, maybe sometimes some years, four teams in the playoffs just by, just by, you know, by, by, you know, by nature of the expansion. Well, it's a brave new world and an exciting new world for all of we uh, college football fans, especially we old timers. Things are changing once again, and it's going to be exciting. I mean, we wanted the 12 team playoff. We wanted the expanded Big Ten Conference, and uh, you get what you ask for. It's going to be fun. With us today talking NCAA investigations and uh, speculating about the upcoming season has been beat writer Aaron McMahon from MLive. Aaron, always a pleasure having you on the show. Enjoy the rest of football camp, and once we get rolling into the season, we'll uh, be sure to get you back. Absolutely. Always glad to do it. Thanks much. On Quick Hits today, receivers coach and passing game coordinator Ron Bellamy, along with special teams coach J.B. Brown, met with the media on Thursday. Bellamy had high praise for his group. He compared Tyler Morris to Ronnie Bell, who he spent one season playing with. He said he has no limitations as far as a ceiling and can do it all as a receiver. He loves where sophomore Kendrick Bell is in his development and praised Samaj Morgan, saying we can use him all over the field. He mentioned that Frederick Moore looks good and is competing to be a starter. Bellamy mentioned that Amorian Walker is back working hard at wide receiver and is a great fit. A reporter asked him why he's a good fit, and Bellamy said he's 6'4", fast, and athletic. So good news from the receiver room so far. J.B. Brown said that junior kicker Dominic Zaveda has done a great job at long field goals in practice, going 6 of 7 from 50-plus yards. He's also been very consistent from inside the 50. Brown said Samaj Morgan, Tyler Morris, and Will Johnson are the three guys he's hoping to use on punt and kick returns. No injury news to report, which 
as we know, is always good. Don't forget to tell your Wolverine family and friends about the show and join us next week as we're back with the latest news from practice and probably more chatter on what the NCAA is up to, especially if they release the NOA, which is rumored to be any day now. That does it for this week. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Have a great Wolverine week, everyone. Until we meet again, take care, and as always, go blue. Thanks for joining us today on The Michigan Man here on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew. Our listener lines are open 24-7 for your calls at 313-263-4842. That's 313-263-4842. Or email us at the Michigan Man Podcast at yahoo.com. That's the Michigan Man Podcast at yahoo.com. The Michigan Man Podcast is produced at the studios of Robin Lynn Productions, Allen Park, Michigan, and is not affiliated with the University of Michigan. Go Blue!